was born and raised in Leningrad, now St. Petersburg, and I went to Leningrad State University, which is one of the uh, two um, most well-known and prestigious uh, oldest schools, and mine is the oldest school in, in Russia. I went to philological department, uh, studied English and American uh, literature and languages, and uh, as a part of my course, I was required to take uh, combat propaganda, that's what it was called, or spets propaganda, which is a military propaganda course. All people in our department, in order to graduate and get the master's degree in English literature, had to take this course. And then we would uh, get the military ticket, so I was a lieutenant. I was taking it at the time when the Soviet Union was almost collapsing. So nobody really paid attention or took it seriously. I've been called recently cyber war analyst, I've heard that before, but I really am not. I'm a writer, I'm not a propagandist. I slept mostly through that, that course and thought I would never go back to it. I wish I paid more attention now. I mean, I, I'm astonished that I have to sit and remember what we were doing then. So we were trained to work with the army and population of the enemy. Let's bite into propaganda from here. The profession that doesn't exist here and exists there and everybody knows it. Called Polytechnolog or Political Technologist. A political technologist develops techniques to brainwash people. Basically, that's their first number one task. It's based on psychology, history, cultural and behavioral patterns, and so forth. Uh, to give you a better idea of what it is, if, uh, have, has anybody seen the film called Inception? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So that's what Mr. Cobb was doing. Stealing the ideas, the dreams, from subconscious, and then trying his major task was to plant the ideas into people's minds. And that's what political technologists of Russia do very successfully back in their own territory and outside throughout the world. I'll show you how. This guy doesn't look at all like Leonardo DiCaprio, but that was the lieutenant colonel who used to teach us. His name translates literally as hold the mountain, like a big up. And um, we used to write these pamphlets. I, I had to do it personally. It's not somebody who taught me. I had to sit down there and write, American soldier, surrender, you are surrounded. First of all, had a really good laugh. I, I mean, it was ridiculous. Nobody took it seriously. It was in my department, English department, it was um, all girls because the guys had to go and serve in the army. It was a war in the Afghanistan. We had no men. So it was all, all very, you know, like girls who were interested in fashion and nails and stuff. So those were sitting to nails there. And right, American soldiers are running us around it. Uh, some people would get more creative. I found some articles on the web um, from some guys who were the students at their Middle Eastern faculty. And they were more creative. They would uh, come with something, what brought you here, brother? Come home. See your family. The most creative one I've seen while you're rotting in trenches, a billionaire is kissing or making love to your girlfriend. Go back home. Yeah. Next one, please. Uh, so, uh, the way it was done was quite peculiar, just how secret it was, and also ridiculous. We had these um, notebooks that were about that thick that we, in the beginning of the course, had to pierce with a big needle that you used to sew your shoes. Those we have in shoes as well. So, and the thread, so we would thread it together, tie the uh, threads together, and then each individual um, uh, notebook would be stamped. There would be a seal, like a 19th century wax, and the seal. And each page had to be accounted for. So, we had this pathetic incident. We also didn't have toilet paper in the Soviet Union. That's socialist for you. So, apparently, some creative people would use occasionally a page from a secret uh, <laughs> notebook with toilet paper. And one time, I personally was present when our Hold the Mountain uh, officer brought the piece of paper back to the classroom and we were comparing the handwriting. Oh. to see who was the, per the criminal who could tear off the secret. So, um, yeah, this is a real anecdote. That's what 
was happening. We were not the only lucky ones to have that. The journalist at Moscow State University had uh, that course as well, um, and some other institutes as well. It's called and defined, I still remember that in Russian was drilled into my mind, the art of sowing discord into the ranks of the enemy, which is true, by the way, uh, by the means of disinformation and manipulation of conscience. Here are just some people who went to the same school with me. Do you recognize anyone here? The woman behind the phone. Oh, actually the guy in the middle. Yeah? And the guy in the woman. Can somebody Three. name? Okay. Putin, Can, uh, yay. Uh, 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 Dr. No. <laughs> and, <Mike laughs> and then uh, the guy on top I recognize as government official. Very good. Yes, he is the right hand man of Putin, Igor Sechin who is the head of Rosneft, the major oil company in Russia. All these people went to the same school. Uh, these are the trolls. Uh, has anybody heard about Leningrad Trolls Factory? Yes. Uh, the, the, the one that you sit and uh, write posts in Facebook and Twitter that we receive here on the sand. They, they, they are the young people. They are the, the graduates <laughs> now. They also happen to study at the same faculty that uh, I was going to. Russia. Uh, this is not as bright, but I just wanted to show you the size of the country because sometimes people forget just how big it is. And it's important because it, it really influences the mentality there, the geopolitical trends, several facts that are important to remember. It was the USSR uh, from 1917 to 1991, and they called it communism, although it was not, God only knows what it was. Uh, <laughs> and then it was exchanged for this structure which we called mafia state, uh, and basically could be summed up to the power of oligarchs, very rich people, mafia, which oligarchs are also that, and the former KGB, now FSB, these so the four structures. Mm -hmm. Corruption, very important. Putin is a dictator, in case you know you, you, you somehow missed it or you were hearing <laughs> other things. Just a reminder, I'm from the same city. I remember when he came to power, I was working with the people who worked with him. It's, you know, it's like in San Rafael, San Francisco. I, I, we were like all together in the same port. He's older, but I remember it very well. I didn't forget. The image of Putin as a strong man is well known, even here. Uh, here is a very popular image of him uh, with bear chest right in the bear, and it says, Bear will not ask anyone. <laughs> yeah, I'll leave it at that. Moving on. How did it happen? Because he was just like. One little schmuck, I remember that, nobody knew about us. He, he looked horrible, he couldn't speak, he couldn't walk. Uh, he arrived back as a uh, KGB, then FSB officer back from Berlin, um, and basically didn't. Ha there was no space for him in the system that was disintegrating. Well, over the last 20 years, the propaganda machine, and we're going to address exactly how it happened, turned the majority of the Russian population into ultra patriots and here you see, this is in case you are too far to see, this is Putin's portrait, there are people kissing Putin's, port Putin's portraits and some of my friends have seen these people doing this. So it's not like everybody in the street of Russia kissing Putin's icon, mm -hmm. but it, it's been done and they look up to him. So one important thing about Russia Hmm. There is lack of ideology right now, which is a very controversial thing and hard to understand and grasp, especially for such a religious-minded people or collective mind as Russia. Because Russia has been bred on Russian Orthodox religion, on Christianity, for ages and ages. Then Christianity was taken away from them in 1917. The churches were destroyed, and they were offered communism for the, a space. They basically were religiously into communism. I'm saying they because I never was there. I came too late, and my parents were not into it, so I kind of watched it from the distance. Right now, it's a society, strangely, without a real ideology, at least for the governing apparatus, for the people on top, because for them, the only faith, the only religion that they have is money. These are people who came to power in the beginning of the 90s, and they believed in capitalism. They believed in the capitalism in the worst sense of this word, not Robert Reich 
sense of the word. But like this Marxist bad oppressive capitalism where everybody is on their own and as much money as you can make is the best. They had to bring up a facade or a front of ideology in order to reign. They tried to go without it, that didn't work. So they using the propaganda machine to rule, to in increase their personal riches and personal wealth, and uh, to install their uh, front or the visibility of ideology. But this lovely chap um, is Mr. Alexander Dugin, and he is the main ideologist or ideologue of the Kremlin. He's called the brain of Putin. Um, so it, this is an incredibly complicated subject. I've listened personally to hours and hours of lectures on Duganism. Uh, it's very arcane. I'm not going to even try to, to tell you what he thinks, uh, but he is very well connected with the old right movements in America um, with Richard Spencer. Richard <coughs> Spencer's wife is his personal translator, translates his work. Uh, David Duke, he's a good friend of David Duke, who lived in Moscow for five years, by the way. Matthew Heimbach is another um, neo-Nazi, the, the neo-Nazi of the year, he was last year. He's an old this guy and he's the Russian Orthodox, by the way. Uh, let's go to the next one. Uh, and uh, he, meaning Mr. Dugan, is on his part connected to the KGB FSB structures because his name sponsor, uh, someone called Malafeev, uh, is connected to the Patriarch Kirill, the main person in Russian church, uh, who also used to be the KGB officer. If all of this sounds like, oh my god, this is too much, <laughs> all you need to understand here that it's one structure that governs a very big country and the people on top are interconnected like this and they are basically bandits, mafia, oligarchs, people who made money rapidly and uh, by very dishonest means, and the former KGB. So um, specifically because we are here, we are interested in our country's uh, well-being, what is Putin's interest and ambitions when it comes to America? As early as 2014, I found that article, U.S. would benefit from such a president as Putin. And that wasn't a joke, that was a very serious article on RT, Russia Today, uh, and the, the whole text is going on how wonderful it would be to have Putin for American presidency. <laughs> as absurd as it sounds, not as absurd anymore as then. It doesn't seem absurd at all. Now. I mean, yes, yeah, exactly. essentially what we have, a surrogate relationship. Yeah. Right, exactly. And it's, they are not hiding it. It's a subject that doesn't sound as very sexy or exciting, you know, propaganda, you know, makes people sleepy. People should pay attention to that because they are openly stating, we are going to come and get into your brain and then into your land, and the message is out in the open and nobody is listening. And if we don't ring the bell, if you don't go home and tell your friends, like, this is what I heard, you should see for yourself, you know, we're not propagandists, but we should see for yourself, thank you. Um, what it is, if the word doesn't go around in a few years, because that wasn't like this in Russia as well, nobody was kissing Putin's portrait when I used to live there, it, it all happens gradually. So anyway, not to scare you, but this is Putin's American ambition of 2017. Economic goals, to stop the sanctions that were imposed by Barack Obama or on Russian oligarchs and uh, some companies, and have the U.S. leave the NATO in order to weaken the European community that, and be, make Russia more powerful. The ultimate goal is to weaken the U.S. through the internal conflict, schism, and dissolution, eventually, possibly, Brexit style. Uh, and I know this sounds still like, oh well, but they were working on Calexit. You probably heard, have you heard of Calexit? Mm -hmm. yes. So, yes. Yeah. Yes. So that the guy who was promoting Calexit was married to a Russian woman and lived in the city of Yekaterinburg. And uh, although he was American, he certainly was supported by the Russian structures. There is a separatist movement in Texas as well. Uh, so this is all happening. They're slowly working on it. The world domination is the 
ultimate goal, obviously. And here is a, it's a very rural place, and there's a big poster there which says, today is Crimea, tomorrow is Rome. This is a great song they shared the little article with the video where there uh, is uh, children in military uniform and the member of Russian parliament singing a song. It's, it's like, it's very new, it's just one month old, just released. Uh, we will bring back Alaska to the harbor of our motherland. They also sing a lot of other interesting things uh, in that song, so you can visit it. It's in the event, if you click on it, you'll see it. Uh, let's go on here. Uh, this is Uncle Vova. We are with you, seeing the children. Uh, Vova is a diminutive for Vladimir, so oh. it's basically mm. Uncle oh. Vladimir Putin. We will be with you if you call us to go into the last battle. We will go with you. We'll die for you. And this is a flashback and kind of would be traumatic for me if I were not trained not to take it personally because I was forced to wear this little signs on my chest, on my apron, because I had to wear an apron mm -hmm. in school. Uh, and this is a young Vladimir Lenin, uh, the, you know, the founder <laughs> of the communist state. So there's definitely a parallel, and they're using these uh, things that are not immediately obvious, especially to the younger generation. But they are sending us back to the Soviet Union, to the time of the Soviet Union, the USSR was a power. So, uh, this is additional goals for the for Putin's propaganda machine. Creating a scapegoat, creating the enemy for internal security. It's a very old trick, was not invented by the Russians, was used forever. Like when uh, one part of population has been singled out, uh, and then, you know, sometimes it's a Jews, sometimes there's the other nationalities, but it, uh, then, um, so, in this case, we're having the Americans being singled out as the scapegoats. So this says, shut your trap, chick, or chicken. And this is the bald eagle, yeah. and this is the bear. So bear, yeah. you know, it's Russia, this is the, the, the chicken, in this case, is America. In case people don't get the subtle message, it says here in big letters, we are against the politics of the USA. So, you know, so to be crystal clear, this is a horrible racist connotation, which I couldn't even get to the bottom of it because it's so intricate. It says, banana, Obama, it doesn't even say, so, uh, and banana says Ukraine, and here it says, don't, don't choke. And to be honest with you, I th I'm still not exactly sure what it means, it's something really bad, but it's very... It's a lot in soccer. Um, for the African players, they throw bananas at them, oh. like they're an ape in the tree. Yeah, yeah. So it's, a, it's so, a racist yeah. insult. It's a racist insult, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but the whole Ukrainian, because Obama uh, put the yeah. sanctions in, yes. uh, and right. this is connected to Ukraine. So anyway, even if you don't get it, if you're a person just walking by there and yeah. see five of this on the way, and you don't know exactly who Obama is, yeah. and, you start getting this uh, subconscious yeah. message. Okay. What is the main goal of Commerce Propaganda? And uh, this is what I want you to remember. If you go home and you forget everything I said, which is totally okay, I want you to remember hopefully three things, but if you can only take one, that <laughs> will be the word generalization. demoralization of the enemy. And if I am to expand on this, it will be demoralization um, or weakening of the enemy population and the army. That's what was drilled into us. But basically it all boils down to the morale and it could be achieved through several means and it could create different effects, mainly leading to confusion and losing ability to think independently. And to the state of panic. How is it done? We'll be getting through it again and again and again, but I want to just like start by summing it up. By planting discord, planting discord, that's another thing. Discord is a very old principle, it's divide and conquer, yeah. right? We all know that. So, you know, the ancient people used that, yes? Well, America's an incredibly racist country. 
And America is an incredibly sexist country. So exactly. they have used, I have watched, they have used very effectively exactly, racial uh, imagery and sexist imagery. Yeah, and we are going to get to some of that, but that's a very good observation. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the, in fact, I'm going to go, I don't have a slide for that, but we it's all happening, so we know what's going on. The sex scandals of today, mm -hmm. they are happening, they are real, just like we are real here. There is uh, Weinstein, or whatever is his name, and all these women he offended there. Like, we can go on and on and on. All this happened. This, this is the reality, mm -hmm. and we're going to get to that in a minute, too. So the people there in Olgina, Troll Factory, are sitting there, and they're analysts. And they're looking up, they speak perfect English, and they're looking <laughs> up and reading everything. And they said, oh, this is perfect. We're going to get on Facebook or on Twitter and get these feminist groups and then we're going to get this other group, um, say, I don't know, parents group, and get to the fathers. And then we're going to clash one against another. <coughs> and this is going to be a, an epic battle. And that's what we're watching now. Meanwhile, there are so many advantages to this. A, that's a lot of noise and bad buzz that distracts from the real economic changes in our particular situation that are right. happening. That right. deals with pipelines, yes. for example. Yes. There are environmental yes. disasters. Exactly. I, I'm not even going into like tax system. Yes. I mean, there's like everyday things mm. that need to be done discreetly. And this noise is helpful in any situation, not just for us. Problems exist, like you said, like in most countries, there are prob uh, problems between uh, races, between uh, genders, between generations, but in this case, religions, but in this case, they will be used and abused and manipulated. Uh, the, wor the world of real life and the world of dreams inter interconnect, mm -hmm. and there are ripples going from one into another, and at some point you start losing the reality mm -hmm. and, and you don't know which one is affecting which and mm -hmm. that's what plays into the hands of uh, propaganda and I'm very glad to see that you guys are kind of nodding mm -hmm. and look like you're getting me because it's a very difficult concept. Right. Well even though our, our um, origins are so different and our historical origin, origins are so different I feel that many things you're saying right now just parallel what, what our own system is doing to us now with or without the help of the Russians. You know, a lot of things are being used as a smoke screen, so we don't pay oh. attention to what's really the most important of course. essential things that are happening. Of course, and thank you for saying that. That's psychology. This is another extremely important part to understand. So number one was, anybody remembers one word? Demoralization, yes, yeah, you're wrong. So yeah. demoralization. This is a little bit more complex, but if you need to remember one word, it would be stress. Mm -hmm. So what about stress? Uh, the propaganda machine alters minds and behavioral patterns by using stress. This is, here we're going into physiology. We're going mm -hmm. from psychology, from the pure intellectual level, just to the body. Because all this science is based on Pavlovian research. You've heard about Pavlovian dogs. So he was doing his research in, uh, in the city of Leningrad in the 20s and found out when the, his laboratory with the dogs was flooded and the dogs were extremely stressed, their behavior changed dramatically. It was much easier to teach them something that they were not responsive to before at all. Uh, so based on that, him being academician Pavlov, his, he and his co-workers started to do a lot of research. And that being in the Soviet Union, they started to do research on people in the 30s, you know, after uh, Pavlov was no more. And what they found out that what, when we are under extreme stress, when our system is being exhausted, whether it's physical exhaustion or emotional um, exhaustion, like if I speak like this for five more hours, at the end of it I'll be able to brainwash you. Mm -hmm. because, and if I don't let you drink, eat or go to the restroom, I, I will be able to like sell you anything basically. That's how it works. I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm not a propagandist. Yeah. But yeah. this is a good example of how, you know, it could be physical exhaustion in prison. That's how prisoners mm -hmm. of wars are being 
uh, Broken the good example is Manchurian Candidate movie, if anybody knows mm -hmm. that. So it was there uh, all the time under a lot of stress mm -hmm. of all senses, and then after that they can suddenly, and it happens suddenly, change their views, you know, completely. Will be uh, uh, cultural as well. What the white color in uh, Western culture perceived the innocence or more or less neutral in Eastern cont uh, countries or cultures perceived as funeral. So it could be anything. So the propagandists will use the knowledge of the culture accordingly. They study that. They will use it. They will not use the same message in every even city. You know, what's specific for San Francisco, even San Rafael, will not be understood in Texas. Uh, so here is a meta example. I'll tell the story very briefly because it just happened to me the other day. On Monday, I went to Stanford for a lecture with a friend on the, the sudden uh, reform or collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, and I was astounded to find out that the person presenting, the professor from uh, the London School of Economics, as he was introduced, is using the same presentation format as I do. Because I use it for a specific uh, purpose of telling my audience that this red and yellow is supposed to bring up your attention and um, make you feel more agitated. This person was not making any such revelations, as you can imagine. Instead, to my horror, I found out that his main message was that the Americans are to blame for the collapse of the great empire of the Soviet Union. That was his message, which was very, very well presented, very well veiled. If I didn't, uh, if my subject at the moment wasn't studying propaganda, I might have missed it, although I probably wouldn't. And then uh, I, I was very, very upset. It was not a good lecture, and um, at the end I told the presenter so. But when I went home, I did a little research, which I do, I, and that's what I recommend. Whenever you see something that is surprising or strange, do your research. The story I found out as a writer, I mean, like, it's going into a story, into a novel or something. It's the story of this country. And it, I, I'm going to tell the story briefly so you understand. His grandfather, um, they're Jewish, his grandfather, Lev Zubok, uh, immigrated as a child to the United States in 1913 when the Jewish pogroms were happening back in Russia, before the Bolsheviks came to power. Grew up here, spoke only English, called himself Louis Zubok, got his degree at Pennsylvania University, became a communist, and went back to the Soviet Union in the 20s. And there, because he was an American, he became the first American historian working for Stalin. He was the father of Americanistica, of American sciences. And he worked until he was 1967 and went through the purges. Uh, he was saved from being arrested and killed by Stalin's and Molotov's daughter. The, you know, Stalin, you might not know Molotov. And then he died in 1967 because he was in a hotel for foreigners doing his research. And a group of Americans arrived, and Mr. Zubok, the number one American scholar in Russia, was asked to get his stuff in the middle of the night and leave the room because the real Americans are arriving. And such was the humiliation that he died of a heart attack right there. And so now we have Mr. Vladislav Zubok, who is standing there in Stanford and speaking perfect English, you know, with no accent, not like me, delivering this whole spiel how he's been living here since 1991 and that he believes that the Soviet Union was a wonderful place that should have been preserved. And that, that is a person who is not being paid by Putin. This trauma goes deep there. This is how intricate and complicated things are. So I don't want to present this whole thing to you. That brings the human factor to it. It's not just the story of money or somebody's rational thinking. There's this family history, tragedies that, that are at the core of, of people's 
convictions, or at least what people present as their convictions. But the reason I put it here that he was using the same colors, mm -hmm. and he went to a KGB school back in Moscow. So. Uh, the use of smell and taste. Uh, this is the Russian grocery store that is playing Russian television. So you yeah. see the meat you would not like, and you recognize, and then you hear the uh, pro-Putin propaganda coming here, targeted at the Russian um, immigrants who are heavily pro-Trump and heavily pro-Putin, surprisingly. Uh, so this is touch and association. Uh, so most people would recognize at least some of these people, right? You know, Joseph, uh, is that yeah. Lenin? Yeah, I, I feel a little more formal with these people, but that works too. <laughs> yeah, so they all have in common that they do have first names. It's important to remember that they were people. Thank you, Fred. And they are called in cats, little children, and they're gonna koala, and they're sending you this nice, furry, sweet image. propagandists use to get to our minds? Well, this is pretty obvious, and you might have guessed, mass media, internet, public relations, uh, or marketing, as uh, Joel was mentioning, uh, w uh, Western mass media experts, celebrities, uh, public uh, persons, people that are known, our church and religious institutions, opposition political parties, I mentioned alt-right before, but they're not just alt-right, they could be radical left, mm -hmm. they could be pro-African American rights, they could be, we'll look into it a little bit, mm -hmm. and even modern art, and that's just to give a good example, I was in London this summer and we went to Tate Modern, there was a Blavatnik wing of Tate Modern Museum, And Blavatnik, you must know, is a, one of the top oligarchs and Putin's allies. He has his name on one of the Oxford schools, yeah. uh, a lot of cultural institutions. Uh, he's holding a lecture, uh, not a lecture, the exhibit at the uh, National Library in London. And there's this whole part of Tate Modern called, named after Blavatnik. That's what money can get. So the modern art, you you know, you know, don't know who he is. You walk there, you see Blavatnik. And then you, you, like Blavatnik is now good. Somewhere back there, you'll recognize his name. It's like, oh, I saw it. Something connected with art. Everybody recognize this. RT, what does it stand for? Russia Today. Russia Today, yeah. So the formerly was Russia Today. It has new um, wings and affiliates called Rapkli and stuff like that. Um, it stands for Russia Today, the Russian government sponsored television that is broadcasting 24 7 and has a humongous budget. It was 300 million as of 216, all coming from the States and obviously reporting to the state directly, all the way back. By the way, if uh, people don't know uh, by any chance, Al Jazeera is a Qatari state channel and re reports the same way to the al Khani dynasty in Qatar. We have heard that Russia today had to register as a foreign agent, finally, like a couple of weeks ago in the United States. So now it is recognized, it's not just me telling you so. I've been talking about this for the last three years on every corner, like, but uh, now it's very uh, rewarding to see that now it is recognized like so. Uh, it also has internet channels and pretty much has a lot of presence on the internet. On YouTube there are a lot of videos of RT and sometimes they will sneak information out without the little green thing so you wouldn't even know that they are. Google at some point was also pretty oblivious. You would put something on the search in Google and some information would come up without RT little sign or any kind of indication that it's RT and it would be on top of Google and you will read the headlines or you will read the articles without realizing that this is the information um, uh, that is targeted on you by the Russian government.
Social media, again, this is my inception picture, the dream world, right, the whole world of Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Snapchat and a lot of the things that I don't use, I don't use Facebook and sometimes Twitter, but it, it is the dream world of the inception that more and more merge in these days with the real world where you don't know what happened in real life and what happened in Facebook. And so this way, the propaganda is all the way from Olgina, from the troll factory there, can um, influence things here. In fact, they did the experiment the first time in 2015, when they installed the monitors in Times Square, and they put a little event on Facebook, promising a free hot dog for anyone who would show up there, 12, and people showed up. There were no hot dogs, nobody to meet them, but people back in St. Petersburg at night, because for them it was in the middle of the night, were watching the monitor, seeing that people are coming. And that's how it was, they had a little champagne, because that's how they decided, yes, it could be done. And from then on, there was a campaign that was going up and up and up, and got funded more, 2015, influencing the United States uh, through internet and putting together events and um, so we are still talking about basic myths that the propagandists would use this is use of religion and marketing techniques I may slide together so this is a back in Russia uh, this is a Russian Orthodox priest who is blessing the guns that their army soldiers will then take and go kill someone This are uh, the Hollywood, the Hollywood uh, fame box style <laughs> stars, only they are not fame, they are shame. So the opposition leaders are encircled in these places. And this is a public restroom at the Moscow railway station. And I have to say, there has been a lot of progress. When I used to live there, nothing looked that clean. I mean, my God, like, all I see is like that on the doors now. Yeah, Putin is really rules. Yeah, let's keep going. The main directions that the Russian trolls or political technologists or propagandists were focusing on throughout the last two years. Black Lives Matter, there were posts coming from, it is now established because they have IP addresses. There's information, it's data, it was passed on by Facebook and Twitter to the House Intelligence Committees. Uh, so it's not some kind of guess, it is a fact. This, this is not that. Black Lives Matter, anti-Muslim group, uh, groups, anti-Semitic groups, pro-Israeli uh, uh, groups, feminists, homophobia, millennials versus baby boomers, and this is not the whole list. So basically what we see here, that it's going in all directions. Best way to understand how it works, what it really is, is an octopus. I wrote and read a poem at Litquake in San Francisco. This, this horrible image of an octopus that has many tentacles that it reaches all over and that shoots the poison all over the place, that intoxicates the brain or its victims, so the victims are paralyzed and cannot think critically, cannot move on their own. It retreats when in danger and it can change its shape or form. That's why you see the list like this. Like, how could it be? How could they support both the neo-Nazis and all right? And are you saying they were supporting Bernie supporters? Yes, they do. They don't care. They're actually not racist. Like Putin is not a racist. Putin doesn't care. The, the machine doesn't discriminate. They just manipulate and use. They don't care who. It doesn't matter. It's a very hard concept because we are humans. We are not this steel octopus that can operate like this. But th this, is, this is important to understand. So they target the minority groups that are vulnerable and people who are under economic stress will be eventually targeted and they will buy this message. There's a short-term goal uh, for incitement of this, of this conflict is to deepen the existing differences between social groups mm -hmm. and the long-term goal is to use the disconnect to form what they call in Russia the fifth column, and you might have heard this term, mm -hmm. this is the enemy within, mm -hmm. the enemy within the state. Mm -hmm. A category of people hostile to the policy of their state. And it could be again, this could be ultra-right, that could be radical left. 
that they would be used mm -hmm. as the enemy label them. I have found the unclassified, the only unclassified manual on combat propaganda. It took me a long time to, to search for it in Russian internet and the depths through the images and PDF, but I found it and I got it and I was translating parts of it. And so they have, it's very hands-on, practical guide. And so their, their categories and ethno-psychological characteristics by ethnic groups, by people, for every country, there would be Italians, Japanese, Kazakhs, again, the system doesn't discriminate, they target everyone. So for Americans, it was into the good stuff, it starts with the good qualities, entrepreneurial spirit, practicality, uh, lively positive attitude, openness to experiment and risk, lovely, right? Uh, inventiveness, independence, so the positive things go on, and then it goes into the negative things, and for Americans it is lack of discipline, rudeness and bragging, arrogance, arrogance in communication with representatives of other ethnic communities. So the propagandists who will be assigned to America will first learn this and much more before they will start designing the messages. And there are lists like this for Jews, for Russians, it, for Russians as well, with a lot of so they will be very specific. They will really be an expert on your particular group, whether it's ethnic group or gender, support of opposition groups. As we mentioned here, I want to bring to your attention this one visual. It's hard to see, but this is the same picture of Putin with little koala. If you can remember that, and it says no war with Russia. Putin is your friend, and there are more Putin. Uh, photographs within picture Obama because it's the image from to January 2015 at San Francisco State. There was a stand there, and like the moment I saw that, it's like, oh my God, they're here! They're here! They're coming for us! And I, I was running around telling my friends. Some Russians were like, huh, oh, well maybe, and Americans just dismiss as a completely crazy not person. Now I'm getting a lot of emails and phone calls apologizing, telling me like, how could you? Know? Well, I was trained and I grew up there. I knew what was happening. Like, these are the signs. When you see images of dictators with the nice furry animals <laughs> at a bus stop, <laughs> you know what's going on. The experts and opposition group leaders, uh, this is Steven Seagal. Mm -hmm. oh, There's yeah. Gerard Dupourdier, Richard Spencer on RT. What, uh, is it, what does it say under uh, founder online no, they, magazine alternative right dot com? No, what does it say under uh, Siga? Oh, he's a, he's a Steven Seagal on Western media coverage of crisis in Ukraine. Apparently, he's an expert on Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't find another expert. Language. I'm not going to give you the full analysis, but that's what they taught us to do. That's actually what I remember from when I was waking up in my class. We were writing the pamphlets. Use, using of particular words uh, to get your attention, to get into your brain. Um, this is just a sample that I found on the uh, web, or well, since people are interested in Today, America is in danger. There is a civil war. Okay, danger, war visceral words. They are getting to you on a different level, like a drum beat. There will be words like dirty, they would describe things as the pogroms, coup d'etat. Things, coup d'etat is too French, it probably wouldn't be visceral for a you know, native sure. English yeah. uh, speaker. Uh, but the dirty methods, dirty especially, we get the visceral reaction. These are the words, they are key magic words. Writers know that too. It gets to people's senses in a different way. I like long Latin based words that uh, politicians use. You know, when a politician makes a speech addressing people, working people on farmlands somewhere in the middle of America, they don't understand what these people are saying. But when the propagandist from Facebook addresses them, they know that like, these dirty swines, they know what dirty swines mean. So it, it's, it's the, it, that's called neuro linguistic programming, and it's been used and abused. There's a certain news conveyor which I've experienced personally. The knowledge is planted. There are certain particular fact or certain particular rumor, not necessarily fact, something that doesn't in exist, uh, that the Kremlin machine, the Kremlin propagandists, want to plant it in the American collective mind. There will be a slight rumor going on on a board channel like 4chan or Reddit. Did anybody hear about that? 
it's a more like a young hen out. Black web. Um, the yeah, dark, black dark web. net. And there will be something circulated there. Let's take an example, Antifa. Anybody heard of Antifa mm -hmm. here? Yes. You know, anywhere? Okay. Yeah, so there will be a rumor that say at the end of August that Antifa is preparing a massive attack on Trump supporters. So that will be circulating and circulating, and from there it will seep into the social media, not dark net, but Facebook or Twitter, and it will go into some groups. And then people slowly will start picking up on it, and the rumor starts growing bigger and bigger. From there, somebody starting to give an interview to a local, say, uh, Berkeley side. So uh, there will be in Berkeley side, there will be a little mention of Antifa preparing some violent attack on innocent people. Then it will sit, and it might sink down, but when um, the actual protesters arrive, and counter-protesters arrive, and the cops arrive, and there's big commotion, and has anybody been there? During? Yeah. yeah, yeah, me too. So, you're in the middle, everybody's running back and forth sometimes, sometimes they're just standing around and just talking, talk, talk, talk. and there's some correspondence here and there, and then correspondents back uh, in New York, say ABC News, and they, they don't have, for some reason, they don't have anybody on okay. site, but they do want to report because on social media there's a lot of talk of what's going on. So what do they do? They try to find someone or they just read what another person who is on site is saying. So San Francisco Chronicle correspondent is quoting someone, someone who she doesn't, whom she doesn't care to check, and who turns out to be Bass Tickman or Carl Chapman, oh, nice. or one of the leading alt-right hero, who gives her some information. She quotes him, and she puts the tweet in San Francisco Chronicle um, article online. And then the ABC News picks it up and mm -hmm. echoes it, and then CBS News picks it up. Yeah. And then I am there, and a friend says, oh, the ABC is looking for someone to report. And I say, okay, fine, I'm writing an article, I'll report. And I'm on the phone with the lady for 20 minutes, running around, literally, telling her what's going on. Well, Antifa now is running here, and the, the uh, Nazis, or whatever you call them, they are running away from them. Now they are attacking back, and Antifa is standing. Nobody is being hurt. And she's interrupting me and she's saying, no, 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 but I hear that there is a gas being used, the tear gas is being used, and that barricades are being destroyed. And I'm saying, ma'am, I'm standing right here. I'm, it's a small park. I'm only talking over the fountain is, I'm right here. I, they, I, I would see it if it were happening, like I would feel the tear gas. And she says, yes, but uh, I don't remember what channel, but the other channel is reporting that it's happening. And guess what? My report is not going anywhere, which is okay. I don't, I, you know, I was reporting anonymously. I don't want my name on any of this. But uh, the rumor from some rumor from some rumor is getting mm -hmm. all over the nation. Then it picked up by the social media again, and everybody on Facebook who never heard about Antifa before is saying like, "Oh, they are fascists. They are the Nazis. They should be put in prison. They are against the nation." And you know, people don't have time. People somewhere in Boston or, I don't know, somewhere where they never seen Antifa. They just see the scary images. And, and all they can say is like, oh, well, I mean, it's, it was in the New York Times. There was a terrible article in the New York Times. And that's because the journalists are not doing their jobs for whatever reason. And I'm not blaming the journalists. There's so much going on that they are being demoralized by the propaganda machine. They are being used and manipulated as well. This is how it all happens. And this is why I want to actually teach this to the journalists as well, mm -hmm. uh, or to everyone who is involved, the, the users and the producers of the news. Uh, this is what really is happening. There are many, many examples like this um, that, that are happening. So I had a lot of examples of how, it, oh, here it is, like Lizzie Johnson. Yeah, not Jenny, Lizzie Johnson. This is from Kyle Chapman. She's quoting basically a person who, who, base, who talks openly about white supremacists, like why is she doing, and again, she probably didn't have time, she was running with everybody else. And a felon who lives in uh, Daly City. Yeah, he moved. 
one resource that I really recommend is called Hamilton 68. It's Democratic Coalition. A lot of experts who put it together, computer experts and political analysts, uh, and they're picking up uh, the uh, signals from the Kremlin-related agents or the agencies associated with the Kremlin. And they, you will see these graphs there with top hashtags, trending topics, trending hashtags, and also a little summary. So you could see that they, they do the summary of two-week period. That the last two weeks, the uh, um, topics that were pushed by the Russian trolls were all basically the sex scandals. Mm -hmm. And that's how you know what interests them. How do we survive? We're basically being under attack. We don't know anything about it. Our system is not prepared. Well, things are not that bad. They want to demoralize us. We need to stay together. We don't want to be confused. We don't want to panic. We want to stay positive. We want to stick to our values. We want to believe, and I do believe, that democracy is a viable system. I do believe in personal freedom. And that's what gives me strength and, well, maybe faith to go through all of this with all this baggage and knowledge. Because I know and I believe that it is in the human nature to confront this rational manipulation that is uh, only going to enrich a small number of individuals. The best way is to actually give yourself a break. Turn off your television, turn off your Facebook, give yourself like really good quality breaks. Whatever it is you like doing, take a bath, have a cup of tea. But I don't want you to disengage. But when you are there after a good rest, when you're not exhausted, whatever you see, don't make assumption. We are under attack. Be okay? suspicious. No, don't be suspicious. Suspicious is one of these neuro-linguistic programming words. It has negative connotation. Being suspicious puts you in a state of paranoia. Don't be mm -hmm. suspicious. Just uh, healthy questioning, critical, critical thinking. Critical thinker. The head is not for wearing a hat. It's for thinking. It's, it's, <laughs> so no matter whether we are under attack or not. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.